And here we go. We, yeah, we like we live on. So uh, today we speak uh, with Massimo. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, today we speak with Massimo Pelucci, prominent uh, philosopher and author uh, of um, books and articles on ancient philosophy and uh, philosophy on science. We had an interview uh, with Massimo uh, five years ago, but it was banned by a Russian internet censorship government agency. <laughs> and uh, this was one of the reasons uh, why I wanted uh, to speak with uh, Massimo again. Uh, and because you want to get in trouble again. <laughs> <laughs> so we will see. Uh, yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> and my my first question uh, will be with some grain of uh, you know uh, Socratic irony. Uh, when we uh, talked five years ago, you were familiar with Stoicism for not very long, maybe a few right. years. Right. Uh, to use uh, Stoic terminology, you could uh, have been called uh, Procopton back then. Definitely. Uh, how do you assess your progress over the, these past few five five years? Um, have you finally achieved virtue? Of course, I am aware that only wise men can be <laughs> virtuous, but still. Exactly. Yeah, only only a wise man can be virtuous, and I'm definitely not a wise man. But hopefully, I have I have made some progress in in two respects. Right, one from a theoretical point of view that is better understanding of stoicism itself i mean over the last five years i reread pretty much all of the literature the ancient literature that is available on stoicism new translations have come out uh, for instance there have been new translations of marcus aurelius and epictetus just very recently uh, robin uh, waterfield who is a very good independent scholar has just translated both the meditations and uh, the discourses in the Enchiridion. I reread uh, the more recent translation of Seneca uh, for the University of Chicago uh, series. So, you know, hopefully that has led uh, to some better understanding of the theory. And of course, I, I also keep reading contemporary writers, right? I, I keep up with what, let's say, people like Don Robertson or John Sellers uh, and so forth are, are doing. So that that helps my own understanding of things through their through their lenses. Mm -hmm. More importantly, pre presumably, hopefully, I've made pr uh, progress in terms of practice, right? Mm -hmm. So my practice has has actually evolved significantly. Um, and the major reason for that is because with my friend Greg Lopez, I then wrote a book of Stoic exercises. It's called The Handbook for New Stoics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the they say, and I think it's true, that if you really want to learn something, you should either teach it or write a book about it. And I do both, of course. I, I started teaching a course on practical philosophy, practical ancient philosophy at City College here in New York. And of course, I keep writing books uh, and articles. And so that handbook, that, that work with um, Greg really helped uh, focusing my own efforts in terms of practice because we did some serious research about, you know, okay, what were these people doing? What sort of exercises actually hold up to scrutiny in terms of modern science? Because, you know, after all, the Stoics were active more than two millennia ago. And so it doesn't, you know, not, not everything that they said necessarily stands up to scrutiny in terms of modern empirical evidence. So we looked into that. We looked into the psychological literature about what works and doesn't work. And so my practice has changed as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Very interesting. Uh, I read your recent uh, Ask Me Anything post on Reddit, uh, where you call yourself a skeptical stoic. Uh, <laughs> please t t tell about this shift that happened to you. Why, why did you move away from orthodox stoicism? And what exactly is uh, skeptical stoicism in? Yeah, well, you're very up to date because that Reddit happened yesterday. <laughs> uh, so congratulations. Yeah, it's a good question. So first of all, I was never actually an orthodox Stoic, uh, meaning, well, depending on what one means, uh, depending on what one means by that 
phrase. So there are some people today that refer to themselves as traditional Stoics or what I would consider Orthodox Stoics. Uh, those are people who think that in order to be a Stoic, one has to accept the entire Stoic system, including all of the metaphysics. And I've rejected that from the beginning. Uh, particularly, the, the ancient Stoics believed that the universe is a sentient organism, living organism endowed with reason, with the famous logos, right? From which they derive the Stoic concept of providence. Everything that happens in the universe is for good, for the good of the universe. It's very important to to uh, understand, not for the good of the individual, not for my good or your good, but for the good of the universe, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's all very nice, except that I am a 21st century scientist. I see no reason to believe that the universe is alive. Uh, the universe, as far as I'm concerned, is a set of dynamic processes which are described by the laws of physics. I don't see any sentience there whatsoever. I'm a biologist. I think that sentience and consciousness and reason are evolved characteristics of only a very small subset of living organisms. So I don't see any reason to accept that. So, yeah. I, and I never did. So even when, when I got into stoicism from the beginning, that was the first thing that I said, now that that's going to go out of the window. Now, as a result, to be fair, uh, it's true that I cannot avail myself of the concept of stoic providence. So let's talk about that for, for a second, if you don't mind. When Epictetus says, uh, kiss your child and your wife goodbye at night because you know they might not be alive the following day, that way you will not suffer, you know, you will not be bothered. You know, if you read that that particular bit without understanding the stoic concept of providence you you think immediately what kind of a psychopath is this guy i mean what what do you mean i shouldn't be concerned or disturbed by my wife dying of course they should be well, what the hell is going on there right but of course from a traditional original stoic perspective epictetus is perfectly right uh, here is is how he's thinking in terms of a modern analogy if the the universe the cosmos itself is a living organism then we are literally bits and pieces, individual cells of that organism. Now, if you look at my skin cells, for instance, I am not concerned with what those cells are doing so long as they're doing their job. And part of their job, in order to favor, to, to make me work well, right, to make, to make my life good, uh, is that they actually have to die on a regular basis. If they don't die, you know what that means. It's the, it, I get cancer and that's not a good stuff. No, it's not good for me. It may be good for the cell, but not good for me. So that's what Epictetus says. Like, you know, we're cells in this organism and whatever happens to us is for the good of the organism. We may not like it um, because we may think that it's unfair or whatever it is. But once we understand that we're part of these organisms, not only we're going to accept it, we're actually going to embrace it, right? We're going to actually love it because that, that's what makes our life, you know, meaningful. Now, if you do away with the notion of, with the stoic notion of a living organism, a cosmic living organism, then, of course, that source of comfort that Epictetus had, it's not available anymore. If my wife or my daughter should die, I would very much be pissed off and I would very much be disturbed by the thing. But... I can still act as a Stoic and say, okay, but this is something inevitable. Everybody has to die. This is a, just a normal thing. You, you know, it's 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 the way work, the universe works, and there are no exceptions. And it is not in my power to decide when people die or, or not die, regardless of whether they're my loved ones or not. So I had to accept it. I don't have to go as far as Epictetus and embrace it. Mm -hmm. I can, right? I can still suffer and grieve as a result, but acceptance is helpful. Uh, it's, it's still a stoic thing to do. So <clears throat> that's a major difference. Uh -huh. So in that sense, I was never really a traditional stoic. But certainly at the beginning of my study and practice, I accept some accepted some version of modern stoicism. Uh -huh. <clears throat> in other words, the, the famous dichotomy of control, uh, the notion that some things are up to us and other things are not up to us and that we need to focus on the first because that's how we make progress and then accept the latter as they come. The four cardinal virtues, uh -huh. uh, you know, the importance of studying not just ethics but also logic because you want to reason correctly and 
in natural science because you want to understand how the world works. All of that stuff for me is was acceptable, was on board. Mm -hmm. But you know, nevertheless, you rejected not only some uh, cosmology uh, themes in Stoicism, but uh, ethical also, I believe, because uh, you wrote in your blog um, post about virtue and uh, uh, about how Stoics it consider an ultimate good and. Uh, uh, if I understand correctly, you rejected you rejected this uh, central stoic yeah. te te thesis. Yes, that the virtue is the highest good and the goal goal of life. If right. so, what is the goal of life? The goal of life that tell us in your understanding. Right now, that's a, that's a very good question, and that's an important point. Um, in fact, it turns out that my thinking has evolved on its own in a way that is very similar to the thinking of uh, Lawrence Baker, Larry Baker, the author of A New Stoicism, who was a friend of mine. And, you know, I knew I knew his book and that book has made a major impact on me. But I think that it took me some time to really come around to Larry's um, point of view. So mm -hmm. here's what I think in terms of virtue being the, the chief, the, the ultimate good or not. So everything we do, it seems to me, is for two purposes, for two reasons. I mean, if you ask most people, you know, what, what it is that, you know, that your life is about, I would think one answer is biologic, is pretty much biological. That is, our life, the point of our lives is to survive so that we can reproduce. From a biological perspective, there's nothing else going on, right? All of the other stuff is is kind of surplus and interesting and maybe fascinating and all that sort of stuff but from a biological perspective I, i'm a biologist so i need to take that seriously um pretty much the only things that are that count in in life are the fact that we survive at least for a while and we reproduce that's it there's, there's no other point from a from a from a cosmic perspective really there is no other point in human life now the, the thing however is human beings then starting evolving at some point by not only biological evolution, but cultural evolution, right? So cultural evolution is a fairly new phenomenon that pretty much affects mostly only human beings. Other animals have culture, but it doesn't evolve very much. Um, it's, it's stuck there. And the reason, I mean, we could get into a whole discussion about this, but the reason, the major difference is we got language and they don't. Mm -hmm. right? A lot of other uh, animals have means of communication but that's different from a language. A language is a, is a structured communication that has grammar, recursive grammar, things like that. Mm -hmm. Because of language, we are able to teach each other and to build culturally one generation after another. So, right. So, so the the, the human way of evolving has therefore itself, if you will, evolved. Now we have both biological and cultural evolution. From the point of view of culture, if you ask most people, I would think or at least most people that think about this stuff, uh, you know, what is your life about? They probably will say that by the end of their lives, they want to look back and say that it was worth doing. Okay. In fact, there is empirical evidence that that's the case. Psychologists have studied uh, people who are near death, near, near the end of their lives. And they've asked, you know, so what, what are the most important things and what is it that you regret and what is it that you're you know, happy about in terms of your life? And the things that people are happy about are relationships. So having spent time with people, with friends, with, with uh, their children, with their spouses, etc. And uh, accomplishment of meaningful projects. Mm -hmm. right? So things that actually have meaning. And it turns out that things that have meaning are things that are other oriented. So for instance, stamp collecting is not a meaningful project, in, generally speaking. It could, could be fun. I mean, I don't know. I've never done it. But, um, it could be fun to do, but it's not meaningful in that sense because it doesn't concern other people. It doesn't make other people better. It's just uh -huh. about you, right? But volunteering for organizations, teaching, writing, uh, you know, engaging in, in artistic uh, pursuits, etc cetera, etc cetera. those are all other directed projects and they tend to be meaningful because you are helping other people you're having a communication with other people so it turns out therefore 
that most people seem to think that a life worth living is what the whole point is. Now, of course, a life worth living is exactly what the ancient Greco-Romans called eudaimonia, right? Uh -huh. Eudaimonia is often translated as happiness, but it's a bad translation because happiness is kind of a squishy uh -huh. concept, right? More of, more Sometimes it's translated as flourishing, uh -huh. which gets closer. However, flourishing, it really gives it an Aristotelian slant to it. That was the way Aristotle understood eudaimonia. But, but of course, we want to be ecumenical. We want to be coming up with a, with a definition of eudaimonia that is general, not just favoring one particular school. Mm -hmm. So the one that I've used for years now is eudaimonia is the life, life worth living. Mm -hmm. That is the goal. The goal is eudaimonia. In fact, Aristotle tells you right straight, straight out that eudaimonia is the goal. Now, the question is, well, what makes for a eudaimonic life? And I think the Stoics were right that practicing virtue makes for a eudaimonic life. That is, oh. is a, it's, a, it's a fundamental way to uh, become eudaimon. Why? Well, because if you think about it, what are the virtues about, right? So there are four, as you know, there are four cardinal virtues, right? Practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. Well, these are about interacting pro-socially with other people and about using your reason in order to do so, right? So those are exactly the kinds of things that most people think are actually worth doing. That is mm -hmm. engaging in projects, particularly if those projects are in fact other regarding. So I think that the Stoics are right that virtue is the highest good, but it's an instrumental good. Mm -hmm. That is, it's good for something not good in itself. If I am on a deserted island, right, and I practice virtue, what good does that do to anyone? Um, it's not, it's not going to be a, a thing. If I practice virtue on my own, let's say, you know, I close myself into my apartment here in Brooklyn, and I engage in temperance, let's say, right? Uh, so I don't eat too much, I don't drink too much. Sure, that's good for my health. But but what is the general meaning? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that and find that satisfactory. I'm gonna find it satisfactory if it involves other people, if it is a relationship with with other people. So it has to be other directed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that that my conclusion at the moment, at least, I mean, I could change my mind again if we talk again in another five years. But at the moment, I think that the Epicureans were in fact correct um, in this particular regard. That's mm -hmm. Let me let me hasten to say that doesn't mean that I'm about to become an Epicurean because I think the Epicureans were wrong on, on a number of other things. Mm -hmm. But um, the Epicureans were right when they said that virtue is important, but it's instrumental. Instrumental to what? Instrumental to a good life. Mm -hmm. That's what we want. We'll, now, because, here's another way to brief, very briefly to look at it. If you say, hey, I think that virtue is the highest good, I can ask you why, right? And it's a meaningful question, right? You, you owe me an answer to that question of why. It makes perfect sense. But if I tell you happiness is the ultimate goal, you can't really ask me why, because it's like, what do you mean why? Because we all want to be happy. That's it. There is no, there is no additional thing that I can you know, add in order to explain it. And that in philosophy is actually ever since Aristotle, that is precisely what, dis what distinguishes instrumental from ultimate goods. Uh -huh. If a good is instrumental, it makes sense to ask why. But if a good, a good is ultimate, then it doesn't make you feel silly asking why. I don't feel silly asking why virtue is the highest good. I do feel silly asking, you know, why is a eudaimonic life the highest good? Well, that's the definition. Eudaimonic life is what? Yeah, good point. And actually, I uh, I agree with you. But don't you fear that our founding fathers, uh, like Zeno, will blame you in heresy? Yeah, they might. And but you know, the thing is, fortunately for us, uh, Stoicism is not a religion, and so you know, uh, Zeno was not Jesus, and therefore yeah. we're okay. But look, the, the interesting thing about you know, I, I do get a significant amount of pushback as you as you might imagine about these kind of ideas but a lot of these people the, the, a lot of critics seem to to uh, think that, that this is a new thing that that these agreements within stoicism 
is a new thing. It's not. It started from the very beginning. If you read Diogenes Laertius, The Lives of the Eminent Philosophers, chapter seven, which is on the Stoics, mm -hmm. there is a whole list there of people early on in the early Stoic who disagree with each other. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Cleantus disagree with Zeno. Chrysippus disagree with Cleantus. Posidonius disagree with everybody. So, like, this is not new. The question isn't, you know, can you disagree or not? Of course we can. This is philosophy. It's it's a, in part it's about disagreement. If if the disagreement is actually uh, leading to something better, right? So if it's constructive. The question is, do you have good arguments to mm -hmm. defend your views or not? And that remains to be seen. I mean, I'm putting forth arguments and then people can put forth counter arguments and then we'll see who is most convincing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you uh, taught in university a course on history of ancient philosophy, and actually you wrote about uh, this in your blog. At the yeah. same time, the history of ancient philosophy is not your main university speciality. Uh, tell please about your experience of teaching this course. Was it difficult for you? Uh, have you teach the whole history of ancient philosophy, starting with Pre-Socratics and ending with uh, Neoplatonism. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely difficult. It was an interesting challenge. Uh, you know, I, my background is in science, as I said before, and in philosophy of science. So typically, I teach courses in philosophy of biology, or general philosophy of science, or things like that. Uh, when my department chair asked me pretty recently, you know, this last semester, to teach a course in ancient philosophy, a straight course in ancient philosophy. Um, which is a course for our majors. It's a course that every student in philosophy has to take. Um, I thought, why are you asking me this? This is, this is not this is not my specialty, right? And uh, and his explanation was interesting. He said, well, first of all, because your uh, courses on practical philosophy are very popular, uh, a lot of students take them, and they have you know, and and I have high student evaluations for that. So so in other words, there is interest, and of course. These days, university departments have to generate interest in their courses. Otherwise, you know, there's, there's going to be trouble. Uh, and then he said, and, he, and I just would like somebody to just change things around a little bit. Instead of teaching the course in the standard way that everybody else does it, because you come at it from the outside, you might be able to do something different, something that the students might uh, resonate with. So that was the challenge. And yeah, it was difficult because... You know, I was in pretty good territory if when I talked about the Stoics or the Epicureans, you know, all, all the Hellenistic philosophies. But a classical, a standard course in, in ancient philosophy begins with the Pre-Socratics. You know, people like Thales of Miletus and Heraclitus and Empedocles and st stuff like that. And then it goes to the big three, Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. And then only at the end, if there is time left, you talk about the Hellenistic philosophies, right? So, so I was now facing the, the possibility that I had to structure an entire course, mostly on material that I was not very familiar with. <laughs> I mean, I read Plato and I, you know, I read Aristotle and I read the pre-Socratics, but one thing is to read it and another one is to actually teach it. But as we were saying earlier, one, one good way to learn stuff is to actually have to teach it. And so it was challenging, but it was interesting because I learned a lot by teaching that course. I mean, I got some of the best translations of uh, available today of the pre-Socratics, for instance. I selected uh, some key dialogues by Plato and a couple of, you know, two or three major works by Aristotle, that sort of stuff. And so it was a lot of fun. And, it, and because of my interest in practical philosophy... I tried to put the emphasis on that in, in the class. And the students really did respond because they never thought, for instance, that Plato could be practical, right? This is the guy that talks about, you know, the, the world of ideas and, you know, getting out of the cave and stuff like that. You know, it's like, what do you mean practice? According to Plato, the highest possible human activity is contemplation of the world of ideas. That hardly sounds practical. But in fact, of course, Plato also wrote about political philosophy, right? The Republic is all mm -hmm. about political philosophy. That's very practical. He, he goes into a classification of different kinds of governments and then talks about which one is better and so on and so forth. Aristotle, it's actually easier in, in that respect. The problem with Aristotle is not that he doesn't talk about practical things. He does. Um, you know, the, the Nicomachean ethics, for instance, is entirely about practical stuff. And of course, he wrote also the politics, which is about practical stuff. 
The problem with, with, with Aristotle is a different one. So it turns out that Aristotle, during his lifetime, wrote two kinds of books. One that was called esoteric and one that was called exoteric. And the, the, um, the one, one group of books was really lecture notes that were aimed at his students, right? So like I would prepare my notes before class and then distribute it to the students so that they could have a point of reference. And then the, the second set of books was actually devoted to a general public. And Cicero tells us that the books that Aristotle wrote for a general public were gold. Cicero, who was one of the stylists of the ancient world, tells us that Aristotle writes in an incredibly clear and an engaging manner. And if you read Aristotle now, it's like, what are you talking about? There's nothing engaging about it. It's very confusing and it's very dark and it's very you know complicated. Turns out that unfortunately for us, the only things that survived from Aristotle were these lecture notes, <laughs> right? So all of the books that were meant for a general public uh, are gone. And uh, so that is the challenge. It's not that Aristotle is not practical, it's that. And then the pre-Socratics, presented their own challenge because first of all we only have fragments of all of the pre-socratics we don't we don't have any complete book of any any of those people and most of those fragments are very cryptic i mean you, you know you read Heraclitus and you say what the hell is this guy talking about um so there you do uh, even as a teacher you require uh, you have to go back to the secondary literature and look at what scholars have actually said about these people and how they have interpreted interpreted yeah. those those fragments but again that was all a learning experience so it was fun yeah cool and um have you uh, thought about taking up the study of ancient greek and latin because you know the deeper you dive into ancient thought the more you need to know the language in which these sources are written because yeah. you, you can't always rely on uh, translated text in in all aspects yeah yeah that's a good question uh, so the answer is kind of yes and no. Um, I, I am, I can read Latin, um, and so I translated Seneca, for instance, from from Latin and uh, Cicero, uh, and and I can testify, attest to what you're saying. That is, it's you certainly get a much more interesting and nuanced understanding of uh, of the text. However, let's not forget that what I'm trying to do here is not to become a scholar of ancient philosophy. Right. Um, I don't want to write technical papers on uh, on Aristotle or or uh, Plato and then have him read by you know twenty people in the world. My interest is practical philosophy, especially as it applies, of course, to the twenty first century. And so there is a danger in going in that direction you're talking about because then you you know I am a scholar, so you then you're kind of captivated by the scholarship and it becomes a thing in and of itself and you kind of lose perspective of what's going on. Um, it, an interesting uh, sort of way of going about it, which I tried to to practice over the last several years, uh, as I was saying earlier, is to read every translation I can get of hold of especially if it's in multiple languages right like in, like for me i can read italian and not, not mm -hmm. just english for instance and i can kind of look at the spanish translations to some extent that gives you quite a bit of of uh nuance of what's going on because the different translators of course not only they will translate things differently they will add footnotes and they will say here's why i translated this word that way at that point you can go back to the original text Mm -hmm. let's say in Latin and say, okay, let me take a look here. Yes, why, why is it that these people? So in other words, instead of going straight for the text, the original text and retranslate it from scratch, which is a huge amount of work, it's not, it's not easy. And it requires a much better understanding of, let's say Latin that I have, you know, I can read it. Yes, but it would take me a lot of time to, to actually do a complete translation, let's say, of, of Seneca or, or, or Cicero. Instead of doing that, you can do it in a targeted way. You can find passages that are translated very differently or significantly differently by different people and, and say, okay, now let me look at the original text and see what, what I can make up uh, out of, at that, about, about that particular uh, segment. Otherwise, I really do think that there is a, a danger of doing what Epictetus was warning his students about. That is, you know, don't come here 
uh, just to learn the intricacies of Chrysippus' logic, because otherwise you're doing the philosophical equivalent of literary criticism. This is not what we're here to do. Then you're wasting your time. What we're here to do is to become better people. And you don't become necessarily a better person by going into the minutiae of, of the scholarship. Yes, famous passage. And since we mentioned Cicero earlier, and uh, since we talked uh, about translations of ancient te texts, uh, how do you assess, how do you view uh, the subject of the Cicero's De Aficius? Yeah, Aficium or Catechon. Because there, there, uh, there has been a big discussion around these terms for a long time. And uh, someone translates uh, this term uh, like uh, duty and right. others as an appropriate action or uh, rules right. of conduct. Uh, and Tony Long has proper function. Which option is closer to you? Yeah, that's a good question. So I actually just reread the officies very uh, fairly recently. And, um, you know, the, the most common translation of the title is on duties. But I think that actually, I can see why people use that title. Um, you know, it does talk about duties that we have towards societies, to other people, etc. Um, however, I think it talks more generally about what the Stoics would refer to as appropriate actions, so catacomba. And uh, so, I, I, even though it doesn't, it ultimately doesn't matter how you translate the title. It does matter how you understand what the point of the book is. And so, I I do think that. Reading the officies as simply being about social duty of an ancient Roman is too restrictive. It's not, it doesn't do justice to the book. It's really about the duties of a human being as a member of society. And yes, of course, Cicero uses a lot of examples from ancient Rome. Naturally, that's that's where he was living. So, uh, you know, what else would you expect? But I think the book is is important precisely because it's much broader than that. And and Cicero himself thought that this was his best book, or at least the most his most important. Probably not his best in terms of writing because it was written right at the end of his life, and it was never uh, the 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 first version probably was never corrected. He didn't have time because he was killed. Um, so the version we have it's kind of. Uh, essentially a draft more than more than a final polished version but if he, he himself thought of on duties as uh his most important book and so it, it's it it pays to respect the author himself and say okay well why that th does this guy think that this is so important well that's because it's not just about how to behave properly as a roman it is about appropriate actions as a human being is a as a member of of society and you know, we were talking about earlier on why uh, these days I refer to myself as a sort of skeptical stoic or something like that. And on duty was a major reason for it. Uh, so it turns out that stoicism, I think, does have one major deficiency, uh, even as it is understood today. Although it's not just stoicism, a lot of other ancient philosophies have the same kind of deficiency. It really does not address political issues and by political issues i don't mean you know issues of the day like whether abortion should be right or not that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about politics in the general sense of mm -hmm. the term, as in as in the ancient greek term polis you know how should we conduct the affairs of society aristotle does right so aristotle wrote an entire book on on politics Plato does, as I said before, the, the Republic is a book on politics. Now, true, it is a you know it represents a, it depicts a utopia, and it's a pretty bizarre utopia. When it's, it's a combination of you know communism and fascism, and it's like it's weird. Uh, nevertheless, he tried, right? So he gives us a a, uh, a view of how a poly poly polis should work. The Stoics don't do that. There is there is nothing in the literature about this. Yes, Zeno apparently did write a book called The Republic, but apparently it was a very weird book where he endorsed cannibalism and you know he says it's this is going to be a society of sages and so it's not it's not really a political treaty apparently. And in fact, later Stoics were kind of embarrassed by it, and so they they kind of eliminated it from the from the canon. But other than that, we don't have certainly none none of the three big Stoics, the Roman Stoics, has anything really much to say about politics. Seneca doesn't write about it. Um, 
certainly Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius don't write about it. And that, I think, is a deficiency. As I said, it's not just unique of to Stoicism. You know, the Epicureans never talk about politics on purpose. They think that politics is a source of um, pain and therefore goes against their, their philosophy to even you know engage in politics, for sure. Other traditions don't talk about it either. Like Buddhism, for instance, doesn't have much uh, about to say about politics. But I do think that that is a deficiency. And it, it um, became very clear to me that it was a deficiency. Once I started rereading Cicero, Cicero uh, writes a number of books that are clearly similar to the ones that we have from the Stoics, right? So um, On the Ends of Good and Evil, for instance, is a standard treaty on ethics and you know what we would call meta-ethics on how do you choose between different ethical systems. Uh, the Tusculan Dispus Disputations, uh, for instance, uh, or the Stoic Paradoxes, those are all books that are that could have been written by a Stoic, and you wouldn't really be able to tell. However, he also wrote several books that are explicitly about politics. He wrote The Republica, uh, which is a direct conscious response to Plato's Republic. He wrote The Legibus, which is a conscious response, direct response to Plato's On the Laws. And then he wrote on duties, right? So these three treaties are really an interesting, very well thought out, uh, you know, body of literature that that addresses the issue of politics. And I think that is missing from Stoicism. So one of the reasons to embrace a sort of a, a skeptical approach to Stoicism, I think, is is this that Stoicism is missing politics. But the other one is. I think it's even more fundamental. As we know, Cicero himself, who, by the way, is right there on my on my right shoulder there, yeah. <laughs> behind me. <laughs> um, Cicero himself was not a Stoic, of course. He, he considered himself an academic skeptic, but he pretty much was very, very much a Stoic, right? He, in all of his ethics, most most of his ethics comes from the Stoics, and and he says so ex explicitly. Even on duties, is influenced. He tells us by, by Panicius, one of the um, middle Stoics, who was actually an exception apparently because he did write about about politics. So, um, so there is a, a reason. There's a model out there of somebody like Cicero who takes on board a lot of stoicism because there is a lot of that is of value in stoicism but reserves the right to say yeah but not everything there are some things here that are either missing or they're not they're not right and I, as a thinking person as a critically thinking person i reserve my right to change my mind to to uh, reject certain things and accept other things one of the things that he rejects from the stoics for instance is their belief in divination Right. So the ability to predict the future uh, on the basis of things like the flight of birds and trails of animals and stuff like that. I mean, he, he, he writes a book, Cicero writes an entire book where he just, uh, you know, on divination, where he really destroys the Stoics from that perspective. He says, you know, this is this is a lot of crap. What are you guys doing here? And in fact, that book is arguably the first treaty in the Western tradition about what we today call pseudoscience. So Cicero goes in details on, you know, how you 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 balance the evidence, how you uh, you uh, evaluate arguments in terms of empirical claims and stuff like that. So it's it, it's really about pseudoscience. Um, so that's that's why these days I think that a being a stoic, broadly speaking, but with a skeptical attitude, meaning with uh, the reserve clause, if you will, that you know. I don't, I'm not bound to take everything for granted. This is not a religion, as we were saying earlier. So I can I can reject certain things. Now, the typical objection to that kind of approach, to the sort of eclecticism, if you will, that Cicero was working with, is like, yeah, but then you're going to get a hodgepodge of stuff that doesn't really work well together. You're going to get a bit of this and a bit of that and another thing over here. And it's like, what are you coming up with at the end? It, it's going to be an incoherent bundle of stuff. And that is a danger. I mean, if one of the problems with eclecticism is precisely that it does lend itself to incoherent 
to, to adopting incoherent beliefs, which is not a good idea in philosophy, right? You don't want to be incoherent. You don't want to be self-contradictory. It also lends itself, unfortunately, to the possibility of rationalization, right? That you can pick and choose only things you like and discard things you don't like. So those dangers are actually there. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of them. But then again, every philosophy does start as an eclectic mix. I mean, stoicism itself, right? Look yeah. at Zeno. Uh, I mean, Zeno started with the cynics, and sure enough, we have elements of cynicism into, imported into Stoicism. Then he started at Plato's Academy after Plato died, and sure enough, we have elements of Platonism. Then he started with the Megarians, uh, who were particularly interested in logic, and sure enough, we have bits and pieces from the Megarians into... So very a lot of things that we consider stoic today actually come from previous traditions and then were kind of put together by Zeno first and then later on by Chrysippus who kind of cleaned up things and 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 made them a little bit more coherent so even stoicism itself actually started out as an eclectic philosophy so i don't think that's the problem so long as you're aware that you, that you need to be careful and you need to subscribe to things that are not mutually contradictory and and you need to be aware of the possibility of rationalizing rather than philosophizing yeah actually a good, a good point and uh, i consider uh cicero's own duties um good introduction in stoic ethics uh actually uh yeah, al right. although he is he is not uh, a traditional or orthodox stoic himself nevertheless uh, so we we can um, call ourselves some kind of Ciceronian Stoics. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, since you mentioned uh, politics and some political problems, uh, um, I uh, I would like to ask uh, one of my questions about politics, but but not uh, ancient, but modern uh, one. Uh oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, so in, in the last five years, there have been many political shifts, both in, in the West and in Russia. I Indeed. mean, in, in Western countries, the European or USA, um, some populist politicians of, often come to power. And in, in Russia, well, some kind of totally fucked up shit is happening now. Uh, but by the way, I categorically condemn Russia, aggressive war against Ukraine. Uh, obviously, both of these problems are a symptom of a major crisis of democracy on the whole planet. Uh, what should be political position of modern Stoics in, in, in these turbulences? Well, that's a great question. And as I said before, there really is no Stoic answer uh, per se. I mean, we can try to figure out what a Stoic might want to do under those conditions, but there, it's not like you can look up Epictetus and say, okay, here it is. You know, that that's that that's the answer. So one of the problems with stoicism and politics is that politics, the the sort of the system of government under which we happen to live, for a stoic is a preferred or dispreferred indifferent, right? Uh it's it falls under the categories that are not in my power, they're not up to me, essentially. And I just need to do whatever my best is within that system. So if I live in a thriving democracy, then I need to act as a democratic system, uh, you know, citizen and being helpful and contributing and all that sort of stuff. If I happen to live under an autocracy or even a tyranny, then I just have to endure it and do my best to be helpful to people around me. But, you know, that's pretty much my lot and there is not, not much I can do about it. So that is the problem with, with Stoicism, that in that respect, the Stoic might incur the risk of being too passive, that is, are not thinking systemically, right? Thinking only from an individual perspective. And of course, as an individual living in Russia or the United States or whatever else in the world, it's not like you can do much. Even in a democracy, you can't do much, let alone in in a under in in an autarkic system. There's very very little that you can do as an individual, and so the temptation is basically to say, okay, I just have to tough it up. I just have to live with this system, do my best at a local level, and and that's the end of the story. Unfortunately, I think that's where stoicism shows the limitations. Now, you could argue, however, that you. You could articulate a modern 
version of Stoicism that is informed by the kind of skepticism that Cicero was trying to articulate and say, okay, but wait a minute. As a matter of fact, we can still use our reason, our, our critical abilities to think about what kind of political systems are better or less suited to uh, a eudaimonic life. Because after all, what is the point of a political system, right? The point of a political system is to help Stu uh, um, sorry, citizens flourish, right? To pursue their own eudaimon eudaimonic uh, existence. And surely as critical thinking people, we can agree that there are some political systems that are more conducive and others that are less conducive. No political system is perfect. And Cicero was very well aware of it. One of the reasons he wrote the Republic, uh, the Republic, the Respublica in response to Plato is because he said, look, Plato just made up this utopia, but there is no way, there is, that's not a political system. There's no way we're going to actually get to anything like that. So what is the point? So what does Cicero do instead? It begins with an actual political system that had already existed for several hundred years, and that was Republican Rome. And then he asks himself, okay, how do we make this better? Right. Um, similarly, we could do something like that. I think as modern Stoics, we ought to give some thought to uh, what political system actually existing today on the ground, not a utopia, not an ideal, you know, if I could, if I were emperor of the world, what would I do? That's not going to work. That's not going to do anything interesting. But we do have on planet Earth at the moment, a bewildering variety of political systems ranging all the way from essentially autarky to uh, more or less democratic systems. So we could have an interesting discussion as Stoics about, okay, so under which one of these systems would it be easier, more conducive to practice the, the, the cardinal virtues? Which one of these systems is more compatible with cosmopolitanism, for instance? You know, a lot of modern Stoics don't talk enough about cosmopolitanism, in my opinion. Cosmopolitanism, the notion... That we're all brothers and sisters, or whatever gender uh, one describes himself or themselves uh, as, and therefore we're all in the same boat together, and we need to help each other. Well, great. That is a very interesting starting point. It's like some of these systems of you know political systems that we have are more or less friendly to the notion of cosmopolitanism. None of them implements cosmopolitanism. Not even the most advanced democracy is actually cosmopolitan because there's still national boundaries. There are still restrictions to immigration. There's still all sorts of stuff going on there, right? But some of these systems are certainly much more conducive, closer to the ideal of cosmopolitanism than others are. And that is a discussion that we should have as, as Stoics. And then, of course, we should have a discussion of, okay, and what can we do individually to move things in that direction? Now, as you know, uh, Individual action is very limited. I mean, unless you are an emperor or, you know, the president of the United States, it's not like you can do a lot uh, at an individual level. But that doesn't mean you cannot do anything. I mean, one of the one of the dangers, I think, of modern stoicism is that it's, there is a there's a possibility of slipping too much into self regard. You know, stoicism is almost often considered essentially a you know a life hack and you know a way to improve your own life and become better and more successful. That's not what stoicism is about. It's not about success. It's not about making money or becoming an entrepreneur or anything like that. It's about ethical self-improvement, right? You want to become a better person, not a better CEO or 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 a better you know at athlete or etc. Et so there are things we can do. And as, as Marcus Aurelius himself, actually, who was an emperor, obviously, so he did have a lot of power. But as he himself writes in the meditations, don't wait for Plato's Republic, but do whatever little makes a difference right now because it's important. And we can all do some little that makes a difference right now. So, for instance, you mentioned the the war uh, in Ukraine, uh, you know, and I, as soon as it started, I asked myself, so what can I do here? You know, I'm not, I'm not going to go and volunteer for, you know, to fight in the, in, in, in the, in the field. That's, I would get killed in a minute. So that's not, it's not going to do any good. Um, I don't have a lot of power, obviously. I don't, I can't make, you know, decisions at an international level. What can I do? Well, 
I have some, uh, I have two things that I can do. On the one hand, I, I'm a writer and I'm a teacher, so I can bring up the topic in my writings and in my teaching and have people being more aware and discussing the situation. Education, I think it's fundamental for changing the world. And the second thing that I can do is, lucky for me, I have some uh, extra income, right? I have some expendable, expendable income. So I started donating to organizations like the International Rescue Committee, for instance, uh, which are on the ground in Poland, for instance, uh, building, you know, and, and running refugee camps to help the people from Ukraine. Now, that's not a lot, but still m sending contributions on a regular basis, which is what I've been doing, actually helps people on the ground. And that's more than, you know, that I could do by actually going there. I'm not I'm not qualified to actually do anything in the ground, but I have I'm lucky enough that I can do that kind of contribution. Now, is that going to change the situation at a global level? Of course not. But it's going to make an actual difference for, for people on the ground. And as Marcus says, that matters. So why wouldn't you do it, right? So yeah. and, if, and if more people did it, I think the situation would improve significantly. Yeah. Actually, for such conversations, in uh, we, we already could be bound in, in Russia, uh, at least yep. if, if we spoke in Russian. But, uh, but I hope that our conversation is in <laughs> English, so it, it, it will be much difficult to, to find some uh, some subject um, to set um, some some pro some uh, right. how to say it uh, some th some themes that uh, go government consider like uh, Zeus that should be banned um, we actually we have uh, 10 minutes we were running out of time so maybe I, I ask a, a la last question um additional about politics uh in your first in your first book on stoicism uh, how how to uh, how to become a stoic uh, as one of examples of stoic endurance uh, you write about officer james stockdale uh, who spent many years in vietnamese captivity uh, and uh, some knowledge of stoicism of epictetus philosophy uh, served him uh, well there yeah. Uh, and um, Russia's aggressive war against Ukraine forced us in Russia uh, to look at many things differently. Because, you know, I cannot imagine a person who practice some stoic virtues of endurance or something like that and goes to a foreign, co foreign country, Ukraine, uh, to conquer its territories and, ki and kill people. It's just totally right. wrong. So the same question arises about Stockdale. Can, can we cite as an example of some stoic behavior, a person like uh, Stockdale who was participating in an aggressive war against another country? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So Stockdale is one of those things uh, where I changed my mind over the last several years. You're right, in Arabia Stoic, I present the, st the standard line. I mean, you, you read it, uh, you know, from... You read the same thing from Don Robertson or or other authors that Stockdale is a good example of you know what stoicism can do to, for you, et cetera, et cetera. But no, I actually don't think so. I wrote an essay a few years later, uh, sort of criticizing this um, uh, this way of looking at Stockdale because Stockdale actually exemplifies exactly what the problem is if you take stoicism halfway, right? So. The, the typical line of argument uh, is that Stockdale benefited from Epictetus, and particularly from the so-called dichotomy of control, right? Some things are up to me, other things are not up to me. And that's true. He certainly did. Uh, he certainly did survive by his own account the, as a prisoner of war in, in, in good part because he took to heart the dichotomy of control. However, the dichotomy of control is only half of the story. Then Epictetus goes on and says, you know, you, you need to work on things that are in agreement with nature, by which he means you need to use your reason and especially you need to be pro-social. You need to care about other people. You need to be, you know, involved into helping the human cosmopolis, right? So, so that's the danger of using only, only some aspects of stoicism. The dichotomy of control by itself is not an ethical rule. If you think about it, 
It could be used by a psychopath just as effectively as by you and I, right? It, uh, it doesn't tell you anything about how to behave. It only tells you that you should be concerning yourself with your judgments and not with the outcomes of your actions because you control the first ones and you don't control the latter ones. That's true. That's a result of stoic ethic, uh, sorry, of stoic physics, right? And it's a result of, of the stoic understanding of psychology is absolutely true, but it doesn't tell you what kind of judgments you should have. But Epictetus did tell you what kind of judgments you should have. That's why he goes on and developed three disciplines, the famous three disciplines of desire and aversion, you know, action and uh, ju- and, uh, and assent or, or judgment. The dichotomy of control pertains only to the first of the three disciplines, right? It's about uh, what you should be valuing or not valuing. That's it's, it's, it's about what you should accept or not accept. But it doesn't talk about the other two. So you need to go and, and read the rest of Epictetus and t- when when he tells you what a ju- good judgment is, and when he tells you that you should be acting in a certain way toward other people. And I guarantee you, going to bomb other people in their own country is not a stoic thing to do. There's no question in my mind that that is the case. Now, the stoics were not pacifists. I want to make very clear this because this is a point that it's in- in- important. You know, Marcus Aurelius obviously was an emperor and a general. He, he went into the field. But notice that he only engaged on purpose in defensive wars, right? He only defended the confines of the Roman, the, the borders of the Roman Empire. He did not actually go into anything, anything else. And the Stoics in general are not pacifists because they realize that we live in a world where sometimes you do have to take up arms. No question about it. But they also cosmopolitan. And so this notion that you will go out there and bomb people or send tanks into into another uh, nation because you want to take it over, it's like nonsense from a stoic perspective that is simply not the thing to do. Not only that, and I, I'm going to, I guess, conclude on, on that, on, on this uh, note, in the, ca- the case of Stockdale is even worse because not only he participated in, as you say, in a war of aggression, that was really not justified on ethical grounds. It's worse than that. He was, right before the war started, he was at the Bay of Tonkin, uh, where the, there was this famous episode where the Vietnamese uh, boats allegedly fired on, the, um, on, on American warships, and it never happened. Right? This was made up by the Americans as an excuse to get into war. Stockdale was there. He was flying planes that night. When he got back, according to his own words, because this is in his in his old uh, published journal, when he got back and he was told, "Oh, we're going to war because the Vietnamese, you know, attacked us," he said, "What attack? I was there. There was nothing." So he knew that this was under false pretense, and he didn't say anything. I would argue the stoic thing to do would have been to quit the navy at that moment, go straight to the New York Times and denounce the war as based on false premise. That would have been the stoic thing to do. And if Stockdale had done that, then definitely he would be a, you know, a, a stoic role model. But he didn't. Uh, he went along and, uh, and uh, basically was complicit in you know, hundreds of thousands of people dying as a result. Yeah, great, great answer. Uh, I, I'm glad uh, that you reassess your opinion on, on Stockdale. Uh, so we run out of time, and it, it was a great pleasure uh, to talk with you, Massimo. Uh, so we will work on uh, cos- cosmopolitanism. Uh, and um, uh, thank you. And uh, maybe uh, Arate and Eldi Mania with you. <laughs> Thanks. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Bye.